Murder at Toby Lake, Matthias Jones series by R.P. Fitton. Copyright 2016 by the Robert P. Fitton Revocable Trust. Murder at Toby Lake by R.P. Fitton. Prologue. Toby Lake, Hamilton, New Hampshire. Death threats are to be taken seriously. Davis set down the phone and backed away. For weeks, he knew he would have to use his connections in Boston to get a handgun. Now a man's clear voice harassed him openly from the choppy cell phone. Maybe the fight at Club Max last night still had some lowlife upset. He walked to the A-framed house's sliders and peered out over Toby Lake's blue water. He had watched that lake frozen in the winter, and as the fall foliage fell to the ground. All the crazy parties, the booze, and the sex. A few times last week, as summer approached, people walked the trails along the lake, and he'd even seen kayakers and rowboats crossing the water. Who do I call? he asked out loud. Desiree was gone. He couldn't call Hamilton Fletcher after smacking the old fool in the face this afternoon. Fletcher threatened to take away his grant money. The phone rang again. It was a long, old-fashioned ring, the kind they used to have on the black table model phones when he was a kid. All the parties had ended. All the guests had left for good. This is Brad Davis. Breeze rumpled against the phone mouthpiece. Hey, Davis, you getting nervous? Who the hell is this? I'm the man who's going to kill you. What did I do? He laughed, and the breeze picked up again. Who asked you? He laughed again. Oh, you and this individual are well acquainted. You're enjoying this. I can defend myself. I have weapons. You have nothing. I know every square inch of that cottage. You have no weapons. Don't worry, Bradley. It will be over quickly. Tell me why. Because I enjoy killing. My only concern, Bradley, is taking you down. And I know Mr. Fletcher took your car away. You should have just done your job. How do you know about my job? You're a dead man, Bradley. The dial tone sounded. Davis slowly dropped the phone to the receiver. Maybe it was a hoax. He walked quickly to the bar. He mixed himself a vodka and cool cranberry juice from the refrigerator. Then he dropped in the ice. His tenure at Hamilton College had ended with a right cross to Hamilton Fletcher's nose. The entire genetically altered food enterprise would continue, no doubt, but without him. Boston was no longer safe. Maybe even the West Coast was an option. The wild ride had ended. Murder at Toby Lake by R.P. Fitton Chapter 1 Professor Davis had bullied too many people not to be nervous about the death threats. Irene said he was threatened several times, and the strange people arriving at the lake house scared her. Ever since Gus brought her to Tolby Lake for the summer, she had snooped on the professor more than she watched daytime TV. Gus was tired of listening to her claims about students, people in ritzy cars, and an exotic dancer over there at the lake house. Even Hamilton Fletcher himself frequented the house just that afternoon. He wondered about the dancer. Irene finally removed the whistling tea kettle from the gas burner as Gus gazed across the sandy road. The afternoon light reflected off the cars parked in the pine grove surrounding the varnished A-framed house. Irene, have your coffee, Gus. Huh? Coffee steamed upward from the brown tin cup on the end table. Oh, thanks, Irene. And don't be telling me I'm the one being nosy there, Gus Nickerson. Well, you are nosy, but something's going on. That long black car is Hamilton Fletcher's car. Now, Fletcher has SUVs now. The car out there is a Lincoln Town car. Well, a dancer drove the sports car. Gus grimaced when he tasted the bitter coffee. What did you do, pour Fletcher paint in this cup? Make it yourself next time. What a waste of propane. Gus fully cranked open the cottage window. He leaned forward and cupped his ear. I can't hear nothing. Get that puss of yours back in here. You might as well just run out in the road, Gus, and wave them out of the house. 
Well, something's confusing me. Heh, <laughs> wouldn't take much. Oh, hardy, har, har. Why did Hamilton Fletcher, the most powerful man in town, come up to the lake and visit a college professor? And furthermore, why did he yell at that professor and... Too much hanky-panky, said Irene. She produced the same buzzsaw laugh he had heard for 40 years. Irene, you're always coming up with them perverted daytime show thoughts. Did you really see Davis smack Hamilton Fletcher? Yep. Ah, oh, fiddle fat. He'd be fired on the spot. The Fletcher's own Hamilton College in the whole town. I tell you, Fletcher had a handkerchief over his mouth, all bloody. He, when he got in the SUV, oh, you would have seen the whole thing, Gus, if you hadn't made a career hanging out at the John. Oh, hardy ha ha. I didn't see Fletcher, but I saw that blonde in the skimpy outfit go inside about an hour ago. She had one nice... You would notice that. Just like that retirement dinner they had for Lark Larson last year. Well, Lark Larson is a legend. <laughs> if you consider never having a winning record being a legend. Plus, I saw you eyeing all those cheerleaders. You've got a vivid imagination, Irene. You're the one with the imagination, Gus. Jones, a new guy, is a hot shot from Indiana, and he's already winning games. He's young and... Everyone under 80 is young to you, Gus. Gus rolled his eyes. Anywho. Well, that woman at the lake house wasn't selling Girl Scout cookies. Nope, she weren't. And the professor beat on her, too. I was talking to her by the mailbox. That professor has death threats. Ah, you and your death threats. Gus checked the house through the pines. Woman like her is used to being beat on. What a macho thing to say. Macho, smacho, there you go with that talk show stuff again. Gus shook his head and spotted a sandy-haired man with a white shirt and red tie. He, he and a grubby, balding fat guy in a purple jersey and gray pants talked to the professor. Ah, here we go. What do you see, Gus? Gus was still miffed about being called macho. You ain't turning into one of them feminists, are you, Irene? She pressured her elbow against his shoulder. At 68? Come on, Gus. What the hell is going on over there? I can't see nothing if you knock me on my arse. Irene dug her nails into his arm. They're gonna kill him. Oh, stop it. Gus pushed her hand away and hid behind the curtains when the two men dragged the dancer through the open sliders. They carried her kicking across the yard and jammed her into the Lincoln. And then the engine started. The pudgy guy leaped into her silver sports car. From the sliders, the professor watched both cars spin in the sand. Then he moved outside as the cars disappeared up the lake road. Get the plate numbers, Gus. Irene raced across the living room and pulled out her tiny red vinyl notebook from the kitchen drawer. Gripping her red pen, she traped back to the window and quickly scribbled something in the notebook. What in the name of kingdom come are you going to do with them plate numbers? Oh, you're stubborn, Gus. She carefully placed the notebook back in the kitchen drawer. Gus shook his head and turned as the lake house's screen door slammed. The professor marched across the main room into one of the side bedrooms, but quickly returned with a cell phone at his ear. He talked as he paced near the gray stone fireplace, but his hand soon swung up wildly. Irene leaned over Gus's shoulder. Irene, it's my bad shoulder. I tell you, there's something brewing over there. Somebody's going to get him, and you know it, Gus. The only thing I know is your overactive imagination. Too many women been coming and going, and they're probably all hookers. Even that college lady from Illinois. Now, how do you know who she is? asked Gus. Rum, his eyes still trained on the angry professor. Got her plate numbers. I got all the plate numbers. Well, if they were hookers, I would have gone over there myself. <laughs> Irene stung his leg with her boot. Ouch! Let that be a lesson to you, Gus. Hookers would croak that bum ticker of yours. Oh, hardy, ha, ha. Irene stayed at the window. The professor was yelling at that woman professor, too. Inside the lake house, the professor threw something toward the rear sliders. Gus could not hear his voice through the screen door as he tried to move Irene off his shoulder. How do you know he yelled at her? You can't hear a damn thing either. 
And that little Rusty, the student, he smacked her all around, and yet she hangs all over him. Well, what's the big attraction over there, anyway? Ignorant, Gus, ignorant. Inside the lake house, the professor made one final comment and then stuck the phone back in his pocket. He strutted across the room and picked up a drink. Then he exited the rear sliders overlooking bright blue Toby Lake. Well, the party's over and I don't see no hookers. I have to use the john. Gus abandoned his position, and Irene nestled herself in his spot as he stretched his long arms in front of the chair. Davis has made too many enemies. Sooner or later, somebody will bag him, and bag him good. Murder at Toby Lake by R.P. Fitton Chapter 2 Jones looked at his analog watch. Hamilton Fletcher's party guests were now squeezed into the refurbished drawing room, and the accumulated conversation was loud enough to drive him through Hamilton Fletcher's study to the glowing aqua pool outside. Even with his main camping trip only hours away, Jones stayed at the party, but he wondered if he was really waiting for Zoe Wilmont to arrive. He was still miffed about her rejecting his suggestion last week to see a movie downtown at the Cornucopia. Hey, coach! said a deep voice from behind. Jones turned. Dressed in an Aussie hat and jeans and a cut-off t-shirt, Lark's former assistant, fired by Jones, stood with a can of beer in his hand. Froggy Finley, I thought you had left the area. Well, I'm back for summer football to help you, coach. I don't think so. Lark has friends in high places, so get used to it. Forget it, Froggy. You're all done. I told you that when I fired you. Right a mundo, he said. He broke into a sprint out the door toward the pool and disappeared up the side lawn. He was about to check the time when the Fletcher grandfather clock back inside the house slowly resonated inside the drawing room. Hollings' eyes opened wide as he spotted two students, bathing suits dripping, about to step on Hamilton's new rug near the atrium doors. He pushed them back and closed the study doors. Jones grinned as Carl Rogers shuffled his well-toned frame along the pool tiles. Carl had done a great job since Lark's former assistant coach, Froggy Finley, had retired after Jones arrived in town from Indiana. Jones was about to talk to Carl when Hollings stormed through the atrium doors. He always looked as if he had to use the restroom. What's the matter, Hollings? Have you seen Mr. Fletcher? No, not for a few hours. Hollings made a few grunting noises like a pig and began questioning the other guests along the pool. In his orange bathing suit, Kyle hobbled forward, and Jones patted him on the back. On the disabled list? As a matter of fact, I was running near your uh, house on the common, and I twisted my ankle in a pothole. Jones raised his finger. I've hit that pothole on my bike. It's been there ever since I moved here. The guy at the highway department says he has one line for that pothole and everything else. What's that? Oh, my men are on it. Yeah, sure they are. You are right there, Wobble? W wobble! Should I add that to my nicknames? You might want to have that ankle looked at, said Jones. I know some sports medicine guys in Prince William. Carl hit his arm. And I know all the nurses at the infirmary. Right, getting sick can be interesting, but you should take care of that. Now, nah, a little water therapy and I'll be fine. Are you going in the pool? Maybe Matthias will take a dip, said the silver-haired Nigel Kent, dean of students, as he stepped up. I can see you won't be swimming, Nigel, said Jones, eyeing his blazer and cocky pants. A swimmer I am not, but feel free to swim a few laps. Hamilton swims laps every night. Do tell. No, Nigel, I think I'm going to head home. We're leaving for Maine early. Well, Zoe didn't attend the party, said Nigel, glancing around the pool and carriage house at the far end. He crunched his lips. Odd, she said she would attend. The blue-eyed Carl removed his sweaty jersey, revealing his bronze, well-developed chest. Jones grinned. You look like an advertisement for one of those exercise programs on late-night TV. Well, I gotta keep in shape, he said. He turned and dove into the iridescent pool, splashing water onto the blue-glazed tile. Oh, he's in great physical condition, said Nigel. He knows what he's doing. Carl swam over to two women on the other side. Yeah, I would say he knows what he's doing, Nigel. Nigel again looked toward the drawing room and pointed toward the garage area. 
Well, speaking of woman, Matthias, your Professor Wilmon is here. Jones's face tightened. She's not my Professor Wilmon. Well, that's not what I heard. Not what the gentleman who owns the lumber yard says. And he was by this afternoon delivering some trim for the carriage house. Are you telling me Arnie Doers was over here spreading rumors about me? Well, he said that you and Ms. Wilmot... Nigel, I learned a long time ago not to put any credence in anything Arnie says. Bucky Driscoll is overheard on his campus radio saying the same thing. Broadcasting it? I'm not involved with her. We've been out on a few dates, that's all. What an idiot. Bucky or Arnie? Oh, it's interchangeable. Wait till I get my hands on Bucky. I'm afraid you'll have to wait. He's on vacation in New York City. I guess that's where he's from. Nigel, that guy is an ongoing disaster. Bucky takes a bad situation and makes it worse. Well, I won't get into that. Will you at least talk to him about being on the short way, talking about my own personal business? Yes, I will speak to him when he gets back. As far as Wilmont goes, she is a pain. You've heard her at the faculty meetings, little Miss Sassy. Not that she just has an opinion, but it's like she knows it all. Spoiled little rich kid in that white Audi convertible. She rides around campus as if she's it. Hmm. And she lives at the Marlboro Inn? Well, they do rent rooms at the Marlboro, Matthias. You mean suites. Nigel raised his dark brows. I do believe I detect an inordinate interest. Perhaps Mr. Dewars was right. Oh, don't be ridiculous. She said no when I asked her out again last weekend, and that's it, said Jones. Carl's powerful arms churned like a steamboat paddle as he swam laps in the pool. Look at him. This is a kid who worked his way up. It just wasn't all handed to him. Well, he won't last here long. He'll have his own football team somewhere, and then you'll have to take back Froggy Finley. Oh, no. Jones caught sight of Wilmont, tall and slender, in a tight-fitting blue dress, talking with several of her female colleagues at the far end of the pool. Froggy Finley, Locke's biggest mistake was relying on him. Well, Froggy could be quite assertive. Wilmont's brown eyes and brows complimented her dark shoulder-length hair. Do you know what I went through getting Froggy out of here and hiring Carl? The guy has a bunker mentality. Plus, I didn't like the way he pushed around the boys. Well, he was a little rough, Matthias, but you forget. Hamilton Fletcher liked him for some reason, but then again, don't quote me on this, but Hamilton likes to have people under his thumb. Wilmont's dark long hair, usually combed neatly, was wispy down her neck. She clutched her drink as Hank Wenzel from the math department approached. Jones listened to her precisely enunciate her words. Her eyes were incredibly expressive as she fidgeted with the glass. You're staring. Did you hire her, Nigel? Yes, I was involved. I heard the Fletchers made a private call on her behalf. Well, that, of course, is confidential. Yeah, I knew it. Her eyes darted as she lectured Wenzel. Jones faced Nigel. Poor Hank. Too much pontificating. I wouldn't take her guff. Who does she think she is? Well, why don't you ask her? Here she comes. Jones looked to his right. Wilmont's lost expression was transformed into a wide smile, and she extended her hand to Nigel. Her eyes brightened. Dr. Kent, the Fletchers always provide such a lovely party. I am sorry I was a little tardy this evening. I was just remarking to Professor Wenzel that we should have more of these gatherings during the academic year. I think you're right, said Nigel. Jones rolled his eyes, but her potent perfume caused his nose to itch, and he sneezed. <laughs> Bless you, she said with a snicker. Of course, you know Matthias Jones, Zoe. Oh, of course, our beloved coach. He and I have gone out on occasion. Hello, coach. Her whimsical voice and smug attitude irritated him. Call me Matthias. <laughs> Amusing. She looked him over as if he were not properly dressed, and maybe he wasn't. Something wrong, Miss Wilmont? You know, I wish to be called Ms. Wilmont. Oh, Ms. and Matthias, said Jones, smiling. Her face was rigid. Right. Just a joke. So you've gained some great notoriety here very quickly in this small pond called Hamilton College, Mr. Jones. What do you mean by that? Don't be so defensive. Me? You talk like you're above everyone else. Well, I could say the same of you, Mr. Jones. Her eyes revealed an inner buzz as if he had just kicked a bee's nest. 
and you are quite pleased with yourself, aren't you? Yeah, I guess I am. But just remember, this is only a small college in the corner of New Hampshire. You work here too, Miss Snootbaum, and the college has been a great opportunity for me. Well, isn't that just wonderful? I wish you more years of bliss. In a graceful move, she turned on the tiles, and Jones watched her silky blue dress as she sashayed back inside the house. Pip is what she is. Well, I haven't heard that one in a while. Oh, it's one of my dad's expressions, he said as the phone rang. Excuse me, Nigel. Jones. How are things going out at Mount Olympus? Asked Coco. Actually, I can't wait to leave for Maine, to be honest with you. Where's your sense of adventure, Coco? <laughs> right next to me here. Listen, who the hell is Brad Davis? Jones moved along the pool. Davis is a professor here at the college. Let me tell you something. That guy is a loudmouth SOB. I personally threw him out of the club last night. And you're telling me this because? I already talked to the old man, and he blew me off. Well, Hamilton can do that. What, get into a fight with him? You just make it clear to this bastard that I know people and I ain't afraid to use them. Was he that bad last night? Yeah, he tipped over a table and some broad got whacked in the face. I don't need that crap, Jonesy. The cops were over here. Just talk to him. Give him the faculty pressure routine. All right, I'll talk to him. Great, thanks. I owe you. Talk to you. Hey, coach said Carl, still in the pool. The water had matted down his dark, wavy hair. He folded his arms on the pool tile berm. Hey, can I ask you something, Coach? If it's a question about women, forget it. Doesn't it bother you to be stuck at this level? There are other horizons out there. I'm not stuck here. I want to be here. I like it here. I like my job. I like the town. I know you want to take the fast track, Carl. Juanita, in her black maid uniform, leaned out the kitchen door. Matthias, George Strickland is on Mr. Fletcher's line for you. Oh, good. Thank you, Juanita. You about your trip? I can't wait to get away. It's been a long year. George and I have to meet Tom McGill in Maine tomorrow morning. Well, if I don't see you, have a good trip. He shook Jones's hand. And where are you headed this summer? Well, I'm going home to Seattle for a few weeks. I may drive out there. And that run-down M.G.? Carl smiled. I know, I know. I've had that car since college. I'm looking at an SUV like the Fletchers, or maybe an Audi like Wilmot. Jones sneered and thought of Wilmot's belligerent attitude. Forget Miss Wilmot. Hey, she's an attractive woman. Have a safe trip, Carl. Jones reached down and shook his wet hand. And behave yourself. Do I have to? Good night, Carl. Jones scurried inside and headed into the kitchen. Juanita pointed to the white phone on the kitchen counter. Jones smiled and picked up the receiver. Let me guess, you're backing out of the vacation, George. We're not going. He said as Juanita spoke with the caterer by the kitchen island. What? There's been a murder. A murder? asked Jones as Juanita turned. Who? Biology professor at the college, Brad Davis. George, I just received a call from Coco. He threw Davis out of the club last night. He wanted me to call Davis. Murder? Did I hear murder? Asked Nigel, entering the kitchen. Professor Davis, biology, said Jones. Nigel closed his eyes. Oh, dear Lord, how many times have I told Hamilton about that man? Hamilton will want to contain this. I'm sure he will. Strickland yelled something to his deputy. No, just secure the area, Wendell. Matthias, we have a student, Amy Pollard. Jones leaned toward Nigel. He has a student in custody. Oh, dear God, who's the student? And Amy Pollard. Nigel opened his mouth and staggered to the kitchen chair. The media outlets will be all over this. I think I'm feeling ill. Do you want a drink, Nigel? Asked Juanita. Yes, whiskey, straight up. Nigel looked up at Jones. Where did it happen? In a cottage out at Toby Lake, said Strickland, overhearing Nigel's comment. Toby Lake, Nigel. he's at the cabin. I don't think there's a phone there. I'll have to check with his old boss, that guy he left running the paper. Jerry St. Clair is back in town? The man is a fool. 
I'll head over to the paper now and see if St. Clair can somehow contact Tom. I'll see you later, George. Jones hung up and Nigel sprang from the chair. This is a disaster, an unmitigated disaster. What do you mean? Juanita handed him a full whiskey snifter. It's a burgeoning problem. Brad Davis has a notorious reputation. It would seem so. Nigel sipped the liquor. He's a womanizer. He's had charges filed, warnings. We gave him a chance. I thought it was all behind him, and now this. Why did you let him off? Nigel stood and set the glass on the table and motioned Jones out to the pool. They moved along the hedges. He's engaged in genetic research. Hamilton wanted the school to have a specialist in that area. If I know Hamilton Fletcher, he wants to make money on the deal. Maybe, but Brad Davis was supposed to add to the school's prestige. I managed to contain all the scandals. Well, it's not too prestigious right now. Absolutely correct. I should have pushed Hamilton to get him out while I had the chance. Sounds like this could get messy. I'm going to head over to the paper and see if McGill left a number in Maine. Then I'm going to go out to Tolby Lake. No, wait. You'll have to talk to Hamilton first. You talk to him. Matthias, Hamilton owns that cottage at Tolby Lake. Jones had never been on the Fletcher Estate's second floor. A long hallway led from a central rotunda foyer. Bedrooms and adjoining rooms lined both wings of the estate. Hamilton sat at a small roll-top desk in a tiny study off the main bedroom. The gray-haired Fletcher patriarch read a report and slowly stroked his mustache as Nigel shut the outside door. Mr. Fletcher, Mr. Fletcher, Brad Davis has been murdered at the Toby Lake Cottage. Oh, dear God, he exclaimed as he leaped from his swivel chair, pushing the chair against the desk. I knew that bastard was trouble. He took a swing at me. Sir, why didn't you get rid of him? I've invested over $150,000 in genetic research. The man is brilliant, and besides, I never let arguments get in the way of making money. Yes, sir. Well, who killed the son of a bitch? Well, that's where it gets touchy, said Nigel. Out with it, man, yelled Hamilton as he stomped across the wood floor. One of our students appears to be involved. What kind of monsters are you bringing up here, Nigel? I'm sure there's an explanation and we'll find the truth. Oh, who cares about the truth? I want this thing squelched. And he reached for a phone on the roll-top desk and dialed a number. LG. Never mind the formalities. Get your ass out to my lake house at Toby Lake. One of our professors has just been murdered by a student. I want this thing stymied. Stymied, I tell you. Murder at Toby Lake by R.P. Fitton. Chapter 3. Hamilton instructed Jones to get out to Toby Lake and watch for the college's best interest. Jones needed to contact McGill. Maybe McGill's old boss running the paper in his absence could help. As he drove back into town, he called Coco. What are you, surprised, Jonesy? No, but my question to you is, who was he with and who was the woman he smacked in the face? I'll ask around. Somebody was going to take him out just a matter of time. Jones hung up and twisted the radio volume when he heard the disc jockey announce a commercial for the re-election of Herbert Lane for district attorney. The bulbous Big Mouth Lane had clashed with Jones on numerous occasions. Jones pictured Lane in his office, stomach bulging from his vest, and his gray toupee flat on his large head. The commercial was set to row, row, row your boat. When he turned the station, the commercial played again. Oh, what a nightmare! Jones clicked off the radio and abruptly stopped his Jeep in front of the Enterprise's yellow brick building on Main Street. He exited the Jeep and shook his head as the Herbert Lane commercial repeated in his head. From the sidewalk, the office lights shone over the blinds and the outside shrubs. A lanky man in a blue suit and hat was hunched over a typewriter, and cigarette smoke expanded around his crumpled rimmed hat. Jones climbed the cement steps and rapped on the aluminum frame door. He waited, wondering if the student in custody was romantically involved with Davis. Inside the lobby, the man from the typewriter, his wrinkled powder blue suit as creased as his face, appeared at the door with keys in hand. A multicolored feather pierced his matching cockeyed hat, and a smoldering cigarette hung from the corner of his mouth. He fiddled with the lock, twisted the keys, and opened the door. The heavy lobby smoke irritated Jones's eyes. Three shots in the chest. 
I don't think we've met. I'm Matthias Jones. Jerry St. Clair. How are you, bub? He locked the door and stepped back in the lobby. For a few seconds, he was unsure where to tuck the keys and finally dropped them in his pants pocket. And a Hamilton student in cuffs. Yeah, that's right. But you need to keep this story spiked. <laughs> Nobody tells an old cub reporter to spike a story. Yeah, right. Jones followed him into a side office. Jerry returned to the typewriter, sat at the old creaky wood chair and pounded on the keys. Don't you use a computer, Jerry? <laughs> Words out on you, Jones. On me? Yeah, well, Tom gives you the thumbs up. He said, typing with both index fingers. Tom got his start with your paper. Yeah, I was his boss in Philly before I bought the Enterprise. He worked the grind for me on the city desk. Jones raised his brows as the typing continued. Sounds like we got a homicide to investigate. What do you mean? Jones raised his brows. Look, Jerry, my dad was an investigator, and I've investigated a few murders, but hey, we'll take the friends and associate angle on this one. People like Davis, they come and go over the years. I worked a case in 47, downtown Philly. Guy was tapping every broad he could get his hands on. He liked the skirts. Listen, Jerry, did McGill leave a number up in Maine? Incognito, pal, incognito. I'm going over to Toby Lake to meet George Strickland, but I think I'll stay clear of investigating anything here. We're both eager to leave for Maine, but I think we'll be leaving late. Jerry nodded and set the cigarette in a dirty ashtray loaded with spent butts. He leaned back and produced a raspy laugh. Ha <laughs> you bowing out, huh? I'm going to detail this murder in a series of page one exclusives. Didn't think you were yellow. Jerry stopped typing and swiveled it around. Don't think the old duffer still has it, do you? I never said anything about... Listen, he said, wrapping Jones in the ribs. I spent 40 years in the streets, hot shot. I know how to develop a story and bring in the readers. Yeah, I'm sure you do. What do you know about newspapers? I don't. What? I said. What? Jerry, I don't care, said Jones in a louder voice. Ah, the coach has a temper. Everyone has a character fault, bud. Oh, for the love of... Jones grit his teeth as Jerry sat down again and started typing. You've been in retirement. What, do you got something against old people? No, I haven't got anything against old people. Jones looked up at the large wall clock above the table. He needed to be out at Toby Lake. The edge of the marsh, less than a half a mile past Hanson's Marina, a Hamilton cruiser's lights flashed blue against the brown and white sign for Toby Lake. Jones wanted Jerry back at the news desk, but the old reporter had grabbed another pack of cigarettes and climbed inside of Jones's Jeep. Jones ordered him not to smoke until he left the car but the stale smoke still permeated his suit. For 15 minutes, he listened to stories from the Philadelphia streets as witnessed by Jerry St. Clair during the past 40 years. Jones slowed at the cruiser, and the gray-haired Tully, toothpick in his teeth, stepped from the cruiser. Matthias? Hey, Tull, what's up? Potty boy got blown away. Hey, that's a great headline, copper. I think I'll use that in the morning edition. Morning edition? said Jones in a low voice. It's only one daily edition. Jerry leaned out the window. Tell me there, officer, what's the dirt on the broad under arrest? Dirt? What dirt? She's a student. I'm watching the entrance to Toby Lake. Ask George about the details. Ah, uh, the copper wants money, does he? Asked Jerry, grinning. Hey, watch it, old timer. They bring her downtown yet? What? Asked Tully, opening his eyes wide to Jones. He spoke in a lower voice. This guy's right out of a dime novel. Hey, I need a butt, said Jerry from the passenger side. Stop stalling, Jones. Get this jalopy moving. The road is uh, unpaved and pretty bumpy, Matthias, said Tully. Jones, his anticipation about leaving on vacation, nixed, waved to Tully and shifted the jeep onto the sandy road through the woods. The jeep bounced over the ruts and potholes carved within the constricted road. He crawled in first gear for at least ten minutes, the jeep bounding deeper into the woods. In the mirror, Jerry held a fresh cigarette between his finger and a transparent butane lighter ready in the other hand. More cruiser lights through the branches alerted Jones to the activity near Toby Lake. The road leveled out under the pine trees, and he maneuvered the jeep next to an A-framed house with open sliders and a screen door fenced in yellow police tape. Lights from a single cottage across the road cut through the darkness in the woods. He grabbed his cell phone and exited the jeep. Two Prince William cops guarding the sliders stepped forward as he vaulted the police tape. 
Jerry's butane lighter ignited to his right, and the veteran newspaper man puffed the cigarette red. Jones turned toward the sliders, but another vehicle caught his attention beyond the cruisers. Professor Wilmot's white Audi parked under the pines next to a yellow Ford Focus. What is she doing here? Jerry, cigarette stuck in his mouth, pushed past Jones. With notebook open and pen in hand, he approached the two officers at the sliders. You need to make a run on all the junk boxes here in the yard. Jones recognized the blonde cops. How you doing, Rick? Is Kevin here? No, not yet, Matthias. You're usually here before Clayton. Well, I've got company, said Jones, twisting his lips. Jerry exhaled, but left the cigarette in his mouth as he spoke. Your boss know you're uh, halting the press from an official investigation? Come on, Jerry, chill out, will you? said Jones, moving up the stairs. He saw Strickland talking with Wendell Harris behind a striped sofa. They're not halting anything. Nobody needs to tell an old street reporter how to do his job. Jones winced and shook his head. Rick brought them both through the sliders. Jones scanned the lake house. A massive stone fireplace extended up the wall to cedar slats neatly fitted in the cathedral ceiling. Upstairs bedroom doors were closed behind a balcony rail. The place had a fresh cedar smell and was clean. On the sofa was a thin wood pole wrapped in clear plastic. A chalk outline and dark blood on the braided rug indicated Professor Davis's demise. Happy vacation, Matthias, said Strickland, holding the clipboard next to Wendell. Are we going? Yeah, we're going. Maybe later in the morning. Kevin can handle this. Good, said Jones, looking at the pole. Somebody hit him? She was shot in the head, not hit. Or maybe it was that rumble last night at Club Max. Well, I'm not sure it was a rumble. Jerry's smoke slowly masked the fresh cedar. He plucked the cigarette from his mouth, gripped his pen, and held out his notebook. So, can I uh, quote you on that, Chief? Strickland turned from Jones. Quote me on what? I said, can I quote you on the fact that you're abrogating your duties as Chief and leaving on vacation? St. Clair, what the hell are you doing back in town? What are you trying to do, Stonewall, Chief? Strickland half grinned as Jones shrugged his shoulders. Yeah, you can quote me on that or whatever the hell else you want to quote me on. What happened up here, George? Pretty cut and dry. What concerns me is a report from a Mrs. Nickerson across the street. A Lincoln Continental or a town car was up here from Massachusetts. We traced it to a Leonard Trainer. He works for Albert Fiore. Fiore? You mean the crime family? Asked Jones. Yeah, the crime family. Look, I just wanted to go to Maine. I don't want to be checking out a lead on Albert Fiore. And another car, a silver Porsche, owned by a Jake Corbus. Well, at least it's not Fiore. Strickland put his hand on Jones's shoulder and nodded. Well, he works for Fiore, too. Any other questions? Two cars are out front. One of them is Professor Wilmont's. Well, my question is, why is Zoe Wilmont's Audi up here? I didn't know you kept such close tabs on her. Then again, Bucky Driscoll told Arnie Dewar that you and she... Well, somebody should take away Bucky's radio, and Arnie Dewar should mind his own business. Well, as far as Wilmont goes... Strickland walked around the sofa and glanced at Jerry, clutching his pen. Apparently the girl knows her, and she called for Dr. Wilmont before they sent LG away, and then they called another lawyer. Oh, Hamilton will love that. Then Jones thought... You called her Dr. Wilmot? Are your comments part of the record? Asked Jerry. The ash on his cigarette had grown long, flaky, and top-heavy. What is this? I don't want everything I say coming out in the Enterprise, St. Clair. Ah, you're covering up something. Strickland's dark eyes opened wide and he pushed his teeth together. Jones moved by Jerry and escorted Strickland to the back sliders. Strickland's deputy, Wendell Harris, smirked as they passed, and Strickland pointed at him. Don't you start, Wendell. Who, me? Outside, Jones put his arm around Strickland. George, calm down. I thought we'd be ready to leave for Maine. It could be a couple days. Did you get through to McGill? No, we'll have to wait to get him to a phone. Jones furrowed his brow. So what happened up here? Did Amy Pollard confess? No, no, not at all. I asked her about Club Max, but Dr. Wilmont told her not to talk. Did Pollard do it? Strickland was about to answer when he looked inside the sliders. Jerry's cigarette ash fell near another plastic bag on a thick pine table. Strickland shot back inside. Hey, St. Clair, get the hell away from that. Saturday night special. Hey, did the broad own the gun? 
I don't know that yet. Jerry stepped forward and held out his pen. What about the shells? I have the shells. Wendell waved another plastic bag with the brass shells. Right here. Yeah, what about the prints? No prints on the guns or the shells. I need forensics, Chief. Angle of entry, range of the killer. Strickland pressed his lips. This isn't a press conference. Call Clayton Morris. He's the medical examiner. He wandered back to Jones on the rear deck. I thought we had run him out of town. No such luck, George. What do you think happened up here? We recovered a gazillion footprints on the deck and the slider glass. I can't make heads or tails out of it, but I think she came in through the front sliders. Both sliders were open. He gazed at Jerry talking to Wendell. No prints on the slider handles either. Everything was wiped clean. Davis had a reputation. We were called to his old apartment off campus last year. He attacked a Prince William woman. Charges were dropped. I think Hamilton Fletcher paid her off. And then shipped Davis out here. There's more about Hamilton and Davis, but I can't tell you that right now. Relating to the murder? I can't say. And I don't need Ace in there reporting on that information. I think Paul had entered the house to deliberately kill Davis. Why would you say that? Neighbors across the street. The woman saw Pollard over here all the time. Pollard was wild about Davis, and he may have abused her. Mrs. Nickerson has a whole list of license plates. She said exotic dances, mafia people. Wendell will check out the plates once we get the notebook. This may be a little bit more complicated, George. She was here, the gun was on the floor, and Davis is dead. What's complicated? Jones gazed across the darkened beach area. The outlines of the lake and shoreline were indefinite under the stars. He stroked his chin. Then why are all the slider handles in the gun wiped clean? Strickland closed his eyes. I haven't talked to her, but I'm convinced that she'll confess once Dr. Wilmot calms her down. Maybe she wore gloves and started to cover her tracks, but panicked. Oh, come on. I say latex surgical gloves. Well, maybe somebody else did it. Strickland held the bridge of his nose. You know, I've been waiting for this vacation for a year and a half. Isn't that when we first planned it? Yep. I just called Herbert Lane. Jones smiled. The pudgy Lane hated Jones's involvement in any murder investigation. Oh, wake Herbert from his beauty sleep, did you? I heard his silly commercial tonight. Actually, he was having dinner. Yeah, liquid dinner. He isn't coming over here, is he? Well, he might be over the station in the morning, or he may send his assistant, Roland Chance. He's a real glamour boy. Gold chains and the works. I don't think I can take Jerry St. Clair and Roland in the same room. How does Wilmot know Pollard? Asked Jones. One of her students. Jones moved to the deck railing. What about the beach out there in the lake? We need daylight for that, my friend. As he stared into the starry sky, Jones was troubled about no fingerprints on the gun. Without bothering Strickland further, he wondered why Amy Pollard would have hung around if she had worn gloves to cover the crime. He followed Strickland back in the house. Strickland wrote something on his clipboard pad as Wilmont's testy voice and a prolonged sobbing leaked out the cracked bedroom door. Jones requested to speak with Pollard. Strickland hesitated until Jones insisted. The police chief recanted and led Jones to the door. Before he fully opened the door, Strickland panned the lake house. Where the hell is St. Clair? Well, he stepped outside for another cigarette, said Wendell. Dr. Wilmot, said Strickland as he knocked. You make it sound like she's an M.D., George. Well, that is her title. She's a professor of literature. The door opened quickly. The rusty-haired Amy Pollard, eyes bloodshot and moist, sat on the edge of a yellow quilted bedspread and clutched a dainty white handkerchief. Wilmot had changed into her jeans and her lawn dark hair was brushed and she wore a teal sweatshirt. She moved forward and blocked the open doorway. Yes, what is it? Matthias and I want to talk with Amy. Well, what is he doing here? Me? What are you doing here? Strickland stepped between them. Matthias has worked with me before. I know this is irregular, but sometimes he has insights into these things. Amy Pollard, a blue miniskirt tight over her petite body, stood. I didn't kill Brad. Amy, you don't need to say anything until Miss Merkel Brown is present. Oh, Miss Herkel Jerkel? asked Jones. You're an idiot. I told Amy she didn't have to speak until her lawyer arrived. 
said Strickland. Wilmot's heightened dark eyes darted between Joan, Strickland, and Amy. Her fingers were whitened at the knuckles. Either she was always high strung or the trauma of the murder had shaken her. Jones's smile seemed to irritate her as he faced Amy. Then who killed him? Amy's eyes veered toward Wilmot. Wilmot creased her brow and shook her head. Chief, this questioning by a lay person is unconscionable. How do you know Amy, Ms. Wilmot? asked Jones. She's a student of mine. Now that's irrelevant, Chief. I say we forget about any questioning until Ms. Merkel Brown arrives. Strickland moved closer to Amy. This is your call, Amy, not Dr. Wilmot's. Amen to that. Matthias, that isn't helpful. He faced Amy. Well, I have nothing to hide. I will talk to the coach. Excellent, excellent, replied Jones. Wilmot rolled her eyes and paced the bedroom. Would you like to sit down, Amy? No. She wiped her nose with a handkerchief. You drove over here around 7.30. I'm not exactly sure. I pulled in and I walked through the front sliders. The front and not the rear sliders, asked Jones. Yes. Brad always said... Brad, then you were quite familiar with Professor Davis. What is he driving at? asked Wilmot. I'm trying to see what type of relationship. I did some outside research on his work here at the college. I was one of his students as well as Zoe's. Zoe? Jones grinned. How do you get so familiar with the students? Wilmot raised her voice again. You have a certain arrogance, Jones. And what kind of arrogance is it? asked Jones. Stop it, said Strickland. You did work for the professor and he called you up to come over. You have no other type of relationship. Again, she looked in Wilmot's direction. Zoe, she doesn't have to be answering questions like that. Then the relationship with Davis was more than just a student teacher, asked Jones. Can't you see she's upset? Wilmot stormed over to Jones. And she doesn't need your purian inferences. Oh, don't spin your words at me, Professor. What happened when you walked inside, Amy? Amy raised the handkerchief to her face and tears erupted. Her wailing intensified when Wilmot accompanied her to the bed and held her. You don't have to continue, dear. I only want to know what she saw, said Jones from the door. Brad was on the floor, she whimpered. Dead. Brad was dead. Are you sure, asked Jones. Wilmot still held Amy. What did she just say, Jones? I stepped back. It didn't hit me for a few seconds, and then I screamed. Where was the gun, asked Strickland. On the rug. Jones walked slowly toward the sofa. And you didn't own or use that gun? No. Is that all? Asked Wilmot, leaping to her feet. Strickland turned. Yes, Wendell, bring Amy down to the station. Wilmot raised her hands in the air. Why? I'm holding her on suspicion of murder. She says she didn't do it. Your Merkel Brown can talk to the DA about that. Wilmot nodded, but sent Jones a vile look. Strickland and Jones drifted onto the deck again. George, she's in the wrong place at the wrong time. What? Come on, the gun was on the floor. Trace it. I will. Gloves or no gloves, she was involved with Davis, and it sounds like he had it coming. And we'll check out that riffraff passing through here. Coco's going to call me about what happened at Club Max. Good. Jones leaned on the deck railing again. It took me almost 15 minutes by jeep to get in here. When was he killed? Clayton will verify the time of death. So the neighbors saw Amy Pollitt arrive. Yep. Strickland dragged his notebook from his pocket and scanned his notes. Pollitt arrived sometime during Wheel of Fortune. But she didn't hear the shots. Irene heard a scream. Jones faced his friend. George, how long was Amy Pollitt in here before the Nickerson woman heard the scream? I see your point. She didn't walk in and discover the body. Then she must have seen or committed the murder or been too upset about seeing Davis dead. Strickland looked back inside. A few weeks from now and the cottages will all be open. But now the Nickersons are the only people up here. Strickland looked back inside. What's the matter? asked Jones. Mr. Pull a surprise. Strickland flew through the slider opening. Jerry argued with Amy Pollard and Wilmot on the sofa. St. Clair, what the hell do you think you're doing? Ever hear of the First Amendment, bub? Strickland waved him out of the room. I'm in no mood for this crap. Get the hell out of here. 
Jerry looked up, cigarette smoldering. He put away his pad and stood. Ah, well, this is going to be in the morning edition. And I was at the slider's cheat, and I got notes. Jerry wandered out the screen door. He's an old windbag, said Jones. He prints anything, and I'll lock him up. Strickland turned to Wilmot and Amy Pollard. Miss Pollard, please, again, tell me what you saw when you drove up here. Amy was more composed and cleared her throat. I drove up, and I finished listening to my tape. How long was that? A couple of minutes, and I went inside. Her eyes filled again. I didn't kill him, coach. Jones pressed his lips and glanced at Strickland. Who would want him dead? Brad knew a lot of people. I don't know. Wendell. Wendell looked up from a newspaper. Yo! Sergeant Harris here is going to bring you back to the station. Jones thought she would be devastated by the news of being locked up, but she tearfully nodded and seemed to accept her circumstance. I understand. And again, you can talk with your lawyer. Well, we will be using Susan Merkel Brown, said Wilmot. Campus legal aid, asked Jones. I know other lawyers. Why, have you needed a lawyer before, Mr. Jones? asked Wilmot. Jones squinted. L.G. Bentley is right here in town, and you've already thrown him out. You bring in this Merkel woman. Oh, sure. Well, Bentley is a male lawyer. Oh, come on. What difference does that make? L.G. is an experienced man. I mean, lawyer. He's the best. May we use the phone to call Ms. Merkel Brown? asked Wilmot. Jones rolled his eyes as Amy grabbed his wrist. Her moist brown eyes drooped like a puppy dog looking for food at the table. Coach, I didn't kill Brad. Please, help me. Jones paused. He wanted to leave for Maine and relax for ten days, but he did not think that Amy Pollard killed Brad Davis. He had no side road theories or even a scenario. All right, I'll see what I can do.